Hello everyone and welcome to Broken Slippers episode 1. If you have no idea what Broken Slippers is, I recommend you look at the video right before this where I give a very brief explanation of what we're doing here. In summary though, I'm Lily Holman. I'm a film academic. I like movies. I especially like Disney movies. And we are trying to unpack some of the more unsuccessful Disney movies of the past 30 years. This is not a rant. This is not a... Mystery Science Theater, we're not making fun of these movies. Instead, we're trying to figure out what went wrong and what Disney learned from them. So, without further ado, the first movie we're covering is perhaps one of the most infamous Disney movies ever made. It's called The Black Cauldron, and it's from 1985, and it's directed by Ted Behrman and Richard Rich. So, one of the reasons this film is famous is that it came right before the Disney Renaissance. And if you want more information on the Disney Renaissance, I highly recommend you check out the documentary Waking Sleeping Beauty. It has an amazing, it's an amazing behind the scenes tale of how, how Disney animation basically hit rock bottom and then bounced back with movies like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. But one of the movies that helped it hit rock bottom was The Black Cauldron. But I want to focus less on what what it did to the studio, and more about what went wrong and how the studio fixed it in the future. So, the biggest issue of Black Cauldron is control. It's very easy to blame a variety of different elements as the biggest flaws of the film, but in the end, many of these elements work in other films or are compensated for in other films, and it's the combination and balance of them in Cauldron that causes its downfall. Very simply, you cannot have an edgy film with at least some sincerity, and you can't have an ensemble piece filled with flat and unlikable characters. So this can turn advantages into flaws and get you end up kicked out of the animation building. That's a story for another time. So just so you have a little context, The Black Cauldron is the story of Taryn, who is a young assistant pig keeper, and he is on a quest to protect this magical pig that he's been taking care of, because this magical pig has the knowledge of this evil black cauldron that the villain in the story wants, because it can raise an army of dead. Taryn loses the pig very quickly, has to infiltrate the lair, and with a group of kooky sidekicks, works to try to save the day. But one thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that he very rarely is the one actually doing the saving. In the end, a character called Gurgi sacrifices himself to destroy the cauldron, um, the villain gets destroyed simply because Taryn ends up holding on longer when the God Cauldron sucks people in. And then in the end, um, a very helpful bard negotiates with a couple of witches to get the character Gurgi back, which Taryn has no part of. So that's the summary of the movie itself. But you have a lot of Disney movies with kind of ridiculous sounding plots, so that's not where the flaws are. But as I alluded to, we're going to start with Taryn, our young strapping hero. So, like many a protagonist of the House of Mouse, Taryn dreams of moving beyond his status as assistant pig keeper. And while there is no harm in being aspirational, what is irritating about Taryn is that his desire is purely rooted in fame and glory. We learn about his desires through his different fantasies, and they are frequently the fights or the glowing celebrations afterwards. He is not in it to save the world, avenge a family, etc. He just wants to be a hero. And it is helpful when thinking about this to compare Taryn to Ariel. And it's a little cruel because Ariel's the protagonist whose movie pretty much saved the studio for the damage Cauldron ended up causing. Ariel has a fascination with the human world that she has spent time and effort cultivating. Her desire to join them is a desire to know more and through the knowledge find yourself. She is pretty much a young anthropology student. Taryn, by contrast, is a kid playing dress-up, yet we are still expected to expend the same amount of emotional energy on him. Okay, so we have an unlikable protagonist, but that is nothing new. I'm looking at Frodo, Will Turner, Harry Potter, Peter Parker, all successful franchises, all franchises I love, but these guys are never my favorite character, and I'm sure they aren't yours, so why do they get away with it? It's because there are lovely, charming people surrounding them. And it turns out lovely, charming people don't really exist in the world of the black culture, except for maybe that darn pig. In fact, 
that was my saving grace for the first half of the movie because I was waiting for that one charming sidekick to show up. And karma came back to bite me because so many sidekicks showed up, but none of them ended up being charming. So they kept trying to figure out one that worked, and when it didn't stick, they just added another one instead of removing them from the movie. So the worst of them all is a character called Gertie. And so imagine, if you will, Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but in a movie that treats him like Sam from Lord of the Rings. So Gergi speaks in the same gibberish that Gollum does and is introduced to us by stealing an apple and then whining about having no friends when getting called out for it. Then keeps popping up without notice and without any character development. But every time he pops up, the group seems to like him more and more each time. So people accuse Beauty and the Beast of Stockholm Syndrome, but I tell you this is nothing compared to Gurgi. So Gurgi becomes more than just annoying in the final climax of the film. It turns out that a living being must fall into a cauldron to kill the dead army that is arising from it. So Taran, in a rare moment of heroic, does try to sacrifice himself, but Gurgi stops him. And this would be a moment when voice acting could save Taran, but Grant Bardsley, who plays Taran, is just not quite up to the task of sounding convincing as he begs Gurgi not to jump. So while Gurgi is not the first character to sacrifice himself for the common good, this moment lives up to the film's promise of darkness, as Gurgi mentions having no friends right before he jumps, therefore making this feel like a legitimate suicide. So it's a cynical, disturbing, and unjustified, and I'm still kind of pissed off about it. This also supposedly becomes Taran's driving force for the rest of the film when he kind of saves the day. And so the movie just tries to force us to care about these characters that we don't, and provides us with a needless sacrifice in order to do that. So that is the central problem of this film. They keep expecting us to have these emotional connections that they don't earn. So like, I was angry about this self-sacrifice, but when you look at something like Toy Story 3, there's a similar self-sacrifice at the end of it. But that is three movies worth of emotional investment in these characters. They have legitimate characters with backstories that are compelling and driving forces that are compelling. They are in it to save Andy. They are in it to see Andy grow up and be happy. And so when they have to accept their deaths at the end of the film, you are sobbing instead of rolling your eyes. And so this movie expects us to basically... it. it it doesn't do the work in order to get us to be emotionally invested, but still expects us to be so. So that was the main issue with the characters, is that they treat these characters like they are beloved when they are not. Similarly, they don't have a compelling villain. And that's frustrating, because not very long after this, Disney realized that a comedic villain is much more fun to watch than the standard evil. So this evil or horn figure that is the villain Black Cauldron has no personality. And then in the movie after this, like I said, when we focus on Ariel and Little Mermaid, you have something like Ursula who just oozes charisma. And so when in the end, we're as excited for part of your world as poor unfortunate souls. You have this wonderful balance where even if you're still rooting for the hero, you actually enjoy the elements with the villain. So this also is rooted in the other, the film's biggest flaw as well which is the darkness of the film, so not just in content, but in visuals. And that's because most of the film takes place in the villain's lair, and it makes it really unpleasant to watch. So if you compare it to something like Moana, which is the studio's, studio's latest film, it's so pretty to watch. So even if you don't care about the story or the music, and if that's true, I'm assuming you just don't have a soul, you can latch onto the sheer beauty of Oceana. Cauldron doesn't give you that foothold. The story justification, like I said, is that you spend it mostly in the villain's lair. But because of that, you are surrounded by ugliness. And it just means it's a cynical interpretation of your audience to believe that is exactly what you want to watch. And the problem is that Disney should not be afraid of being edgy. This was a failed attempt at being edgy. But give it about 20 more years and you get something like Ratatouille. And Ratatouille is my favorite thing to compare to Black Cauldron because Ratatouille takes place in a world that is terrifying and ugly because it comes from a rat's perspective. And a rat's perspective on our world is terrifying and ugly because they are forced to live in the sewers or the garbage. And 
the world is constantly trying to kill them. But the thing is, Ratatouille takes that perspective, but then gives us a protagonist who's literally searching for the beauty in a world full of ugliness, and he finds that through food. And he slowly gets his way out of the ugly world into a better world by searching for the beautiful and by pursuing his passions. There are no Remy's in the Black Cauldron. There is no beautiful world to root for amongst the uglies. So I was genuinely disappointed by how much I didn't like the Black Cauldron. Part of the purpose of this project was to find the good in the bad or unsuccessful Disney movies and kind of reclaim them in the public consciousness. And it's kind of sad that the first movie I set out to do this for had so little to redeem it. And the best I can do is look for the little bit at what it tries to do and find more successful moments from their films. So it's beautiful then to compare stuff like The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Toy Story 3, Ratatouille, all these Disney Pixar films, Disney and Pixar films, that prove that this movie does not define the studio these future movies do. And this was just a stumble in a grand history. And there's a lot to learn from it. So hopefully this will be a great point of comparison for future films. At even, the, even the unsuccessful films of, that come after Black Cauldron are a little bit better than this movie. So hopefully we'll find that in the future. In the meantime, don't be Black Cauldron. Watch some better movies. And I hope you stick around and come back and that you have a lovely day filled with pixie dust and happier, happier things.